welcome. Welcome to the Arthur Ross Gallery, to those of you here in the gallery in person and to all of you online. The Arthur Ross Gallery is proud to present the exhibition John E. Dow, Paths to Freedom, and tonight's program, A Conversation with John Dow and Brittany Webb. The Arthur Ross Gallery respectfully acknowledges that it is situated on Lenape Hokin, the ancestral and spiritual homeland of the Unami Lenape. As many of you know, John E. Dow Jr. is an artist and master printer. For more than four decades, Dow's fine art prints, paintings, and photographs have been featured in more than 51 person exhibitions and represented in the permanent collections of 70 museums and public collections. Dow is a Philadelphia native and professor emeritus of printmaking at the Tyler School of Art at Temple University. Dow was trained as a master printer at the Tamarind Lithograph Workshop in the 1960s. In the 1980s, Dow used his works on paper as scores of music concerts. Most recently, Dow has been working on a large body of photographs illuminating histories of the Black American experience. And Brittany Webb, welcome, is the inaugural Evelyn and Will Kaplan Curator of 20th Century Art and the John Roden Collection. In this role, Webb oversees the museum at PAFA, by the way, sorry, um, collections, exhibitions, and programs of 20th century art and provides instruction for the School of Fine Arts at PAFA. Webb first Webb's first exhibition at PAFA, which was about last year, um, Taking Space, Contemporary Women, Artists, and the Politics of Scale, was co-curated with Jody Throckmorton, Curator and Contemporary of Art at PAFA. Webb is also organizing a major retrospective exhibition and catalog of the work of the African-American sculptor John Rodin, 1916 to 2001, and stewards a collection of nearly 300 sculptures by Rodin, leading PAFA's ongoing effort to place his artworks into the permanent collections of museums around the world. Prior to joining PAFA, Webb was a member of the curatorial staff of the African American Museum in here in Philadelphia. Dr. Webb holds a PhD in anthropology from Temple University and a BA in political science from the University of Southern California. Welcome, both of you. Um, a little housekeeping. We will be able to have some Q&A questions after um, John and Brittany speak. Um, for those of you at home, please feel free to type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Thank you. I'm going to hand the stage over to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. I'd like to thank all those who are at home and those who are here for taking time to come to listen to us and have our little discussion and to uh, sort of welcome you to my exhibition here that I hope you get a chance to really come see because they're very dark and they don't come up on camera. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Arthur Ross Gallery for having us and thank you, John, for being in conversation with me. I'm really yeah. excited to talk about the work. Okay. Um... Um, let's dive in, I think. Okay. One of the things that's really interesting about this incredible body of work, which I have to congratulate you on you. completing and getting this exhibition up, but it, it started from a dream. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that dream. Yeah, well, it, 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 it's very interesting. Uh, I've done a little research afterwards and found out a little bit more why, but um, at the time in 2011, I was having an exhibition at the Telefair Museum in, in Savannah. The work I was exhibiting was photographs of, of cityscapes. Mm. And uh, I was very interested in cityscapes in that I've always had this sense about time and, and trying to give people an inkling of what is not seen. So these photographs were mostly nighttime photographs where when people had their windows on, I mean, their window, the lights 
in the window in the house. And so I could peep in with a big enough lens. I could, you know, I can see, I didn't see anything bad though, but it was good, you know. So, but it's my idea about space. So I started having these dreams um, about my grandmother. And so I asked, I had four sisters and a brother and I asked everybody, any of y'all dreaming about Big Mommy? And they said, no. And then I had more dreams and I asked again, nobody. And finally, one of my sisters says, I don't know what you're doing, but we all know Big Mommy didn't play. So you better go back to sleep and figure out what's going on so there'll be some peace because she'll be after us soon if you don't do it, you know? So the thing that my grandmother used to do to me was, she would sit and talk to me a lot of times. And uh, she'd tell me a lot about the South a little bit. And, and she would talk and say like, one of the things she said in the beginning, very, very early, I was about five or six, she said, you really better be good because you know, they'll send you back down South, you have to pick cotton. And I remember that. And so what it turns out in the dream was that, and I'm saying like, okay, I'm picking up Big Mommy. I'm in the South because I don't normally, I have never even seen at time what cotton looked like. Okay, it was only a book. And so then I went and uh, I, I didn't just go. I had to call a farm agent and find three farmers. And then I went to one farm and then I was my experience with, uh, with the cotton. And it was very emotional for me to be there in the cotton. And um, Especially the, the first farmer told me that the property that where I was photographing on had been in his family for seven generations. I said, uh oh, big mama didn't take me home. You know, we were on this property. And so that's how it started in the beginning. And then it has escalated to a, a number of places. And uh, first, I finally found a farmer that liked us and that would be around. So at, when it, the sun would go down, I didn't have to run back to the hotel. All the other places, when the sun went down, I was gone. Francis and I, went, we didn't hang out. It wasn't Harlem, you know what I mean? You in Southern Georgia, you know, you in Virginia, you, you in uh, uh, North Carolina, you know, so you knew where you were. But this one farmer, he loved us and he would talk and stuff and we'd eat and stuff with him. And so that's how the idea got bred in my hand. At one point, I'm looking at the farmer, I says, well, slaves didn't run away in the daytime. They ran away at night. So I, I need to photograph at night. And so uh, that was in 17 and 19, Francis and I went back. For those you know, Francis is my wife who puts up with me. Uh, and uh, we went back to, to Hobgood, North Carolina. And David was wonderful. He wanted to get lights for me. I said, oh, no, no lights, no stuff. Just let now, me shoot. Now, David is a farmer? Yes, David's okay. a farmer, yeah. Yeah, David Mayer, he's something else. But anyway, so that's how it started. And some of its evolution, some of the evolution, there are a lot of other places and stories in between. There was several times we went and uh, I had contacted a farm agent. The farm agent usually would take you and introduce you to someone and leave you. Several times they wouldn't leave. Mm. They stayed the entire time till we left, you know. So that gives you a little idea about some of it, you know. And what kind of conversations are you having with this farm agent in the background Sort of well, I'm not having any, I, I'm not saying anything to him. I'm, I'm shooting. I'm hurry up because he might leave. I got to get finished. <laughs> okay. Okay. But wait, so I want to back up a little bit. So okay. when, you, when you're having these dreams and you're calling your siblings, what's going on in this, in well, this dream that's got you? No, well, the thing is, it, it's, I have dreams where my grandmother's got her arms around me. She's holding me. She's singing to me and rocking me and stuff and trying to give me confidence and everything mm -hmm. and saying like, be careful. You don't have to worry about it. You know, the angels are there. The angels are there. You just got to listen. You have to listen, you know? So those are the kind of things that 
that sort of were guides. And I, but I didn't know they were guides because mm -hmm. she also told me stories that were frightening. She talked, told me stories of people who could see ghosts and see people walking out with no heads on. And I was small and didn't, didn't quite get on. But later, a little later on, I'm saying, Big mommy, that wasn't real. Were you seeing that? It wasn't real. She said, oh, yes, it is. It is. And, and, and actually, six months ago, I found a book called uh, Drums and Shadows that was written in, uh, published in, in uh, 1940 uh, by the Georgia Writers Group. Mm. And they had been interviewing slaves and stuff. There are lots of stories, lots of stories. My grandmother wasn't making it up. And that took me out <laughs> because I thought, you know, just take me out. And does that, did that answer that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, okay. I think that there's something so interesting about um, not waking up in the morning and remembering a dream and, and just going with, I think a lot of us have the experience of, wow, what a strange dream. And then you just sort of shake it off and go about your day. Um, yeah. And for you, it sounds like that that's not what happened. It lingers. It feels like a conversation and maybe a call to action. Yeah, because it was who the dream was about. Okay. And had had spent 40 years not dreaming at all. Okay. To so all of a sudden, why am I all of a sudden? And, and I'm, well, I'm down there with cotton. And it's interesting thing that after the founder, Savannah was really in the Gullah country, which I hadn't realized, you know? And so that's where most of the intact Africanisms transferred. So it was really strong there. So there's all these things I find, I found out later about this place. But in the beginning, I'm just going, taking care. And then when I experienced the cotton and I get, you know, I've done cotton, what I call ghost cotton. I've, you know, all kinds of I've done things where I have cotton fields that are protecting uh, the slaves and stuff, like flying over like bombers. You know, because my brain takes off and it goes wherever it wants to go. All right. And do you think that her knowing that she sent you on this journey? Oh yeah, I really think so. I, I, I a couple of times I really had the feeling that yep. She said, I'm doing it. And then at one point, it started coming back and I said, I got to get back to work. You know, so it's, and they don't all happen as really clear events. They have, there's like a thing that's going on. It's like in a situation where you have the feeling you're getting information. Okay. And you're getting direction and you, you're supposed to follow it, you know, and so. And that's not always clear. That's done with the, and I do like that, you know, that right side there thing starts warming up and kicking up and doing some things, you know, so. And I've learned to pay attention, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And do you feel like that that's about the cotton or the location? Because this isn't your only, this isn't the, your first time shooting agriculture. Well, I, I know, well, yes, right, because I've shot corn. You know, and I'm shot banana plantations and pineapples, you know, in Costa Rica a little bit too. Yeah, I sort of hang out in nature a little bit. It sort of gives me something, yeah. But- um, It seems like you felt something else here. Yeah, it, it, I mean, I photograph, you know, corn, but I didn't stay in a cornfield and just cry. And I couldn't focus. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens many times. And at night, Ooh. that's a different story. <laughs> night, because you swear you're seeing things and you're straining your eyes. Ooh. You're trying to locate what you're going to shoot, but you're seeing other things that out of the side of your eye. You're feeling things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if you're if you're in the room, you can look around and you can see that the so much of the photography on view is cotton shot at night and and you do want to get really close to the images and see if you if your eyes are deceiving you if you're seeing what you're seeing yeah. um and can you talk a little bit about how you went from shooting during the day 
to realizing you wanted to shoot at night and how that felt when you're out in that field? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? Well, um, like I said, we were, I was talking to David when, when evening as the sun was going down, I told him I wanted to shoot the cotton at night and he said, yeah, come on back. And I, I never it felt like, and it was, um, it's interesting how even in the daytime, when I would look at a field sometimes, mm -hmm. and I swear I see some people out there moving, mm -hmm. there's nobody out there, you know? So I don't know how to translate more information of that sensory experience and that it's like a very, very personal thing, you know? Um, at night, it was, um, I didn't hear much, I didn't hear much sound or anything, but I was just, just feeling this really strong, strong feeling and knowing I wasn't not alone, you know. Uh, so I was interesting. I mean, Francis just would go get in the, in the truck. She said, I'm going to call me when you're done. <laughs> She's a little too much for her, you know. But it was, I mean, it is, it is really very interesting. It's very powerful. One of the things in my work, I mentioned before that I was, I've been interested in this idea about time mm -hmm. and I realized feelings about time by uh, presenting a situation that has distant space. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, you can look at your finger in an instant, you can look all the way across the room, you know that's 30 feet, and uh, there's no actual time, but since you are the center of the universe, but you have to get to there, so there's a feeling of time. So many times when I'm, when I'm out shooting and working, I'm consciously trying to find a space that has that distance, has that suggestion about some feeling about time. And so that becomes very important. At nighttime, it became interesting because sometimes when it goes dark, it tends to flatten out unless you get a little spark, a little light back here, a little bit like that, or sometimes you get a little moonlight. You know, but, is, but you do get, but the thing is when that sky is like, you think it's black and you keep looking and it gets gray a little bit and it's get really dark and it lightens up again. That's a whole traveling kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I really tried to capture that kind of feeling and sense and because you, it is, because it's crazy for me because time, you know, I, I'm thinking a lot about time. Time is important. So you do it like that, but I'm in time. It's my current time. But also time is important that I'm acknowledged when my ancestor was there and I got to deal with the time that's going to happen in the future. So this thing is just spinning around in my head. And so I'm dealing with trying to, how can I do this? How can I give all of those feelings and sensations, you know? Yeah, yeah. And photography is a medium that requires it. I mean, when we were talking about you um, sort of being outside and thinking about the sun and, and what it's like to have your mind go a million different right. places with the camera and you're you're looking through the lens and you're also conscious of where the sun is in the sky. That's and right. That's, your shadow you time. There. that's right. Yes, your shadow time. You got to get it. Sometimes you got to wait. Sometimes you got to get down on the ground and shoot through, you know, some and other times you're up on a ladder or, you know, you're up on one of David's piece of equipment shooting from up above, you know, and it's, and you're looking up all the time because you, you're tracking it. That's when it's time to move, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that gives us a different sense of um, space and time and light and right. processing because there's the, there's the mechanics of processing, right? right? There's the, you know, the maker in you, somebody that knows the technique, you know, the technology, yeah. you know, your equipment, you know, yeah. you're, you're measuring light. And that's not just because you're thinking about what kind of photograph you're going to get. You're also using light to measure the passage of time. That's how you know yeah. how long you've been outside, how yeah. much longer you have. Um, that's the Beside difference. my knees. <laughs> of course. <laughs> the body measures time. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about that 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 measuring light and measuring time is 
really the the distance and the difference between um you know this photo and this photo or a photo where you get that that gorgeous orange glow that's right before the sun goes away yeah. and that like pitch 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 black um with these kind of flickers of blue in the background um and i wonder how I wonder if you could just give us a sense of what it's like to try to process that time as a as an artist um, and as a technician and as a creative at the same time that what you've imaged for us, I think, in some of these photos is also the sense of ancestral time and, and the space and the depth that you get where, you know, cotton is this sort of soft, visually compelling plant, but but a full field of it, uh, an entire farm of it gives you a different sense of space and scale, like to the eye, but also, you know, distance in terms of how, how, many, how many feet a person has to travel through that field um, in contemporary space and how many feet a person might've had to travel through that field in historic space or ancestral space. Well, the, the thing is, I'm listening when you sing like that, and I'm thinking of some specific times, you know, that I was really dealing, trying to handle that. And um, I remember just looking, sometimes looking and just looking through the lens in the camera and not shooting at all. Hmm. And, and thinking, you know, and then other times, uh, a little early, a little later, you know, I'm saying, okay, this looks like it. I hope I can get it. And I start praying and start shooting because uh, I'm shooting long exposures and things and stuff in. I'm going through crazy ways of trying to focus, you know, because it's dark. You can't focus. You don't see nothing. You need a contrast. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and I have this gigantic flashlight that would hold up for a minute and then do it. And that's cool for that shot. But then of course, I don't want one shot. I want one next to it and next to it and next to it. And that's when trouble breaks out. Okay. okay. So you gotta be careful and you're doing all kinds of systems you think you have involved. And later on, you find out that they didn't work. And then some did work, you know, so it's, you mean in the processing when you when you get back and you're yes, looking at the yeah yeah okay. well but, well I can get back and you know I'm shooting with a digital you know I can get back to the room and try to look to see what's going what what I did and then I realize if I didn't do something quite right I'm going back the next night and try to do it same place and get it till I get it right you know something like that so does that answer your question yeah all right can we talk a little bit about color I think that. There's, yeah. there's, when we talk about shooting cotton at night, you know, that phrase is, is not as evocative of all the color that's actually in the work. You know, we talk about light and dark and yeah. the, 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 the sort of pitch black night, the white of the cotton. I think um, visually, it's really interesting for people who aren't in the room to hear that there's so much orange, there's red, there's purple, there's green. And, um, and all of that feels different, even in looking at a photo that is very dark, very black with the flickers of white, that you you just also get these these sort of halos of of rainbows of color. Well, God gives some time. <laughs> I don't I I'm very funny. I I try to understand the situation ahead of time, I'm understanding what I'm gonna do. I have an idea about it. And then I sort of let myself really explore exactly how to do it. If some of those pieces have a flicker of, of red and stuff in it, and I remember really working distinctively and saying, well, you know, nothing's happening then. And so for some reason, I had a laser pointer in my pocket, yeah. which is, I'm in the, out with cotton. Why do I have a laser blazer? Laser pointing, I use with my assistant to show him, yeah, it's gonna move that over there. That's too big, okay. that's too small, stuff like that. But I did it. 
And I took that and I clicked. I said, oh my God, look at it. That's magnificent. Let me use this. <laughs> you know, so all of a sudden that it wasn't planned. It was, I became aware of it. And um, it was, it was a tool. It was what's what I needed at that particular time, at that moment. And and the, the biggest thing on a shoot like that is that you're really trying to capture a feeling. And it's really difficult to know. So you do things like you change exposures, you 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 shoot things at 45 seconds, you go, you go three minutes and say, whoa, that was too long. And you come back, you shoot back and forth, and you you are you are you're sort of gauging the environment and how to present the environment in such a way to give that to give that sense of of what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling. That's the thing. And there's so much spirit in the work and in the conversation. I I have to ask you about, you know, how that impacts what what happens afterward when you're not in the field, when you're working with the images and you're trying to give us all this imagery of what you're feeling but not seeing. So, you know, we're we're looking at images where you've got fire that shows up in the work or Oh no, 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 you no, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You jump in the gun. <laughs> You're talking about ancestral visions of a runaway. That's not like these here on the wall. These are these are in the night line night landscape. Mm. These are dealing with feelings and things of that moment, of that space, trying to trying to give you some sense of it. And so the figures in the in these landscapes are part of that feeling of yeah. being there on the ground. Right. right. Okay. Now you're talking about my panels up here. Now a lot of people, some people know, some people don't know that Africans came to this country not you know, came here really intelligent and the rice country proves it because they taught them how to raise the rice. They taught them how to do a lot of things. And, but the Gala people was really stayed connected with the African roots. They did not believe that when you die, you die. They say, well, you die, but you're still, your spirit remains and you have a responsibility for the people who stay. So knowing and some of my reading and stuff is that slaves who ran away, just think it is, you're in the middle of the night, you're running away. You don't have a roadmap. You don't have a thing. How are you gonna get where you're gonna go? You know, so um, there is this, a very strong ancestral connection, some kind of way you hear, you feel, and of course you you know about that's what this piece is about here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you you know about the Underground Railroad, and you know that there's moss on the on the north side of the of the uh, of the tree, and so the moss will let you know where you're north. You know you have a little bit when you're running away in the beginning about some fields you got to get through, but you know you got to get to water because the dogs can't track you in the water. Then you know you got to get to a safe house where you get more information and stuff like that. And then you go on through tunnels and, and, and other stuff. And this is a piece mm -hmm. that was that I once uh, woke up and uh, I wanted to think of what would a slave think about the night they were about to run away? At first, I thought they were, the slave would be dreaming. The slave wasn't dreaming. He was hysterical. And this is like, he was, thought he was asleep, but he really wasn't. He was just running all this stuff in his head. To think. So this is about that trip, that thing mm. like that. So, you know, that's a particular one thing. Now, my pieces up here is that from a little of my own spiritual background and other things is that I know there is this connection to the ancestors. There's the connection to, to your spirit. 
that you're connected to, your angel, your thing. And so what I have imagined is that these are the visions of a slave running away who is connected, who is connected to the ancestors. And they're getting told all kinds of ways and seeing visions and things to how to, how to manipulate and get through. So that's what that, that, that piece is about. So that is me tripping completely out, <laughs> losing it, okay? As opposed to being specific about a place and a thing and a time, you know? And there's some other ones down there. Uh, I have one that I sort of laughingly say that it's really my family. It's called Ancestral Dance and it's the ancestors are dancing. And that's because I'm finally listening to what they told me, you know, so, uh, but anyway, it's this thing that I have this, but that was also, man, I remember that feel that was, that, that was some night. Anyway, I'm sorry. I did, did, I, did I do what you want? No, you took us around the room because one of the, one of the things that I think is nice about this room is that um, it's so, it's such a poetic hang, but that narrative is so subtle so that if you, if you come into the gallery that you, you are dropped into this field and you get these, you know, these different kind of, these hints of color kind of over your, you know, if you want to be dropped into the field, you're, you're in the field and the sky is pink, you're in the field and the sky is black, uh, or you're in the field at dusk when it's just like the last bits of orange, but you do feel like you're in it, you give us that depth. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, it's, it's overwhelming in a different kind of way, because you can, you can see into the deep, deep black, and it's both the, the, it's a textured, matte black of the the surface of the of the paper itself but it's also deep in the sense of you almost feel like you could put your arm out into a portal into some of these images and it's really it's really tactile it's haptic um but it's different than this narrative that you give us behind us here where you have the the moss on the tree and the the rows of cotton fields and the water where it's a very specific experience of being in a cotton field you're not right. in the cotton field as somebody who's owned it going back seven generations yeah. you're in the cotton field as somebody trying to get off seven generations um and trying to get that seven generations off you right that's a that's a very specific experience and narrative that is different and so do you mean for this kind of you know, physical experience to be happening to us. We should be coming into the room kind of this way and put ourselves in it. Is that intentional for you? Or is that just? Well, that's intentional. I mean, I set it up that way. That's intentional. And uh, there are a lot of different things here that relate to very specific things and feelings and stuff that go back. And so, uh, yeah, I set it up to, I'm, I, I, this is an interesting show. This is the slowest show I've ever done. And I've been showing for 60 years. This is the slowest show. You have to look at it. You can't walk in and just go around. You can, you gotta let it speak to you. And it will, you just gotta give it time. and which a lot of us don't have. But anyway, uh, I was, after I had to show up, it, it hit me like, Phew, this is slow. I don't know if people are gonna take the time. And there are lots of things in some of these images that relate back to ideas, like, you know, um, about the escaping, the running away, the one down there about a little bit of joy that is, uh, the, uh, the dream be, uh, dreaming for the wedding, because that's the one thing we could do now and then in certain places we could get married. That's the only thing. You don't know whether you could keep the wife, but you could get married, temporary and stuff. So that, pieces like that. And then there's other things that relate back and forth to different experiences, like that print there that says, uh, they took my sister. Mm -hmm. And that's because every New Year's Eve, the plantation owner had to, he had to deal with his debt. 
And if he couldn't satisfy his debt, then slaves were sold. And they knew at that point that might have been the last time they were with some of their family. So that was an important kind of thing. So there's things like that that meant things to me. And I found images that sort of related to that. I didn't do that intentionally. It just sort of, that's what it was all about. And stuff, so. Am I answering the question? <laughs> yes. If the audience, if you, if our online audience has questions, please drop them in the in the chat. Um, but I also, you know, I have to point out, I think that we're having such a great circular conversation around the the dream, the spirit, the present time that's really the past, um, and how you think about space. Um, and I think the, the, the material piece is really important. So thinking about, you know, what's on paper and what's on fabric in here so that you give us the center of the room that's, it's all the spirit, it's all the, the running through. You can't even walk through it in a straight line. You have it installed so that we have to, you know, go duck in, go around and look at things from one side and then look at it from another. Do you mean for us to get lost in that work and sort of be spinning around in it the same way you imagine and somebody escaping through a field? Yes, I, I, what, I, what I really want is that you seeing looking and trying to get the feeling and the sense of awe of, of freedom or that it's coming, that you're traversing time like. Hmm. Because a lot of these images, like in the visions and things, are are things that I imagine that a slave would have experienced some of these things previously. So they are going and they're thinking of some of this and and running at the same time and being and being involved in stuff. And so uh, for me. And I was saying, imagine if I was running away, one of the things that would be driving me is hearing, like if I've been in church and stuff, hearing the songs and the mm -hmm. things. I'm getting tired, but you know, and I would, I would start singing some spiritual to help drive me on and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have a little soundscape here and stuff and, and, and like that too. So, but anyway, um, No, it's not second time. Oh, oh yeah. So this is the question about the, the soundscape. There's a soundscape that comes with the show. Um, and the question is asking you to talk about it. And also to ask is if this is the first time you've, you've printed on fabric, if you've printed on material for the first time. No, it's the second time. I did the piece Lost in Cotton for my grandmother that was at the AMP exhibition. Mm. And it was on a slightly different taffeta, but this taffeta is better because it's completely transparent. You can see from one side to the other. And that's what I like being able to view it from more than one side. Ah, and you want it to be see-through. You want but us to yes, be able to yes, see I through do it. multiple panels at a time. And I want you to walk around and experience it from different things because it's psychologically different viewing, say from this side and from the other side. And then there's one strange one near uh, of, a, of a waterfall that was photographed in, in, in Haiti. And so that um, that's there. And so, and then the, the psychologically, there are different things about that. And, and it is it's very disorienting yeah. intentionally where you have, you have trees and you have waterfalls and they're not in the places that they're supposed to be if you're walking through the world and looking right. at the world right side up. And um, it's something that I love about this install when I was walking through it for the first time, it sort of felt like I was, spinning around um, and it made me think of all of this writing people did about, um, you know, Harriet Tubman, the great freedom yeah. fighter and the, the visions that she would get and that she still led people to freedom even though she, she'd been injured in the head and it yeah. meant that she had visions and sometimes her vision was spinning. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that for me, that, that was a very important aspect of it, but the, the scale of it making those images that scale and 
the way it looks on that fabric is completely different, of course, than, than the print on the, on the wall and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's a different type of experience. And I, I sort of incorporated a lot of things of like ideas of some ceremonies and symbols and stuff like that in that section, because uh, to me, a slave running away, that would be some of the things that they'd be using to survive, mm -hmm. to generate. And now about the soundscape. Well, the soundscape is that I have a, um, uh, I have a, a some, I was telling my wife, I have some records that I got 45 years ago when I was teaching at the University of Illinois uh, and they were prison songs of uh, uh, prison songs from chain gang things. They had early church music and stuff. Thing. And I had them and I would listen from time to time and I never knew I was gonna use them. And all of a sudden I had a use for them. You know, and so this soundscape is a little like that. In, and ideally, if I had the time, you know, uh, I would have harassed Tom Lloyd over there, who knows a lot about spirits and stuff, and that we would, um, I would get more material together and I would sing it all. Because to me, I hear, I hear it. And so, but, so I found some early, music and and I actually do sing some on it and not that it's the greatest thing but I tried <laughs> so that's what that little bit about uh great Tom you know yeah I wanted to take a lot of the difference between the photographs and the fabric because it seems like your compositional process is different to the three-dimensionality to the fabric images, and there's more different layers and kinds of things going on. Right. It's busier in photographs, you can see it as a totally different. Yeah. It must be hard to get there because it's so long before you can actually get that printed out to see what it comes out like. Yeah, well. You know? yeah, well, that's you. There are surprises. <laughs> No, but the, yeah, the organization for, for works like this is completely different from works like that. And so I'm trying, I'm trying to make a visually, I think the word is sensuous. I want you really to feel it like you're in the woods, you're in the thing, you, you're coming through a, you know, a, 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 a waterfall, you know, uh, uh, at the same time, and when I'm there, you know, you're in the mirror, you're in the middle of a ceremony. You see feet and candles and stuff and things, but that's your memory taking you back there, you know, stuff like that. So, the, so putting those together was, um, and it was funny. Lynn came to my studio. Lynn, um, uh, uh, Lynn Marsden, who is the directress here. Uh, she came to my studio and she says, well, you know, she saw some of my other prints, you know, that she saw the show I had at AMP. And then I showed her some, some things I'm working on. And she said, we could do that. And I said, no, Lynn. And I had this up on the wall. I says, we got to do the back out for this. Mm -hmm. and, and she said, well, I want something different for my, that, that thing. Like, I said, well, I've been thinking about this project, about these visions. And, you know, well, maybe I could do it. And, and she said, yeah, well, well, you do that. And two weeks later, I said, why did I say that? Oh, <laughs> God, why did I say that? And because in a sense, it was like really a lot rougher than I, I really had imagined. But I'm glad I did it now. And it's sick. And because if you look carefully at the piece, you can see some of the spirits moving around in it, like on the bottom and stuff, reflections in the water. There's symbols up in the sky and stuff and things which relate back to uh, uh, some of the Yoruba and stuff. Like you, you see, you see symbols for Ogun and for Baong criminal, and you see Ojuli Frida, you know, around in place like that. And so, uh, 
You got fish in there. You have yeah, look, a fish is bone, dear. The fish is bone coming out, darling. Yes, the fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If I can say photographs like the thing draw our eyes in, the two our eyes of imagination, the thoughts and so on. What it would be it's like the whole body is lost in the images of not the inside of it. Thank you. And that is um, for folks online. That's it's a we're talking about being visually drawn into the photos on the wall and being physically embodied, um, being drawn into the to the to the center of the room, moving through the large scale uh, images. Yeah. Yes. yeah well mm, so yeah. just repeating the question it's about the the energy of um two particularly dark photos um that have these great figurative um shapes that almost they sort of haunt the image i know that i was standing in front of them for a long time trying to figure out if i was really seeing what i was seeing which is great because um it it images for the viewer what you talk about um feeling when you're out there which i think is it's it's hard for artists to do you it's it's deceptively difficult you make it look easy um and so the question is about how how this is happening are these are, are you seeing this are you doing um something afterward how are, how are you giving us these figures that one in particular and there's some others in here i have been working for a while searching for ways to create spirits and i've been doing it with lights and um in some of those there and a couple ones up here up front i have place them in the picture to be the be more related to the actual spirit okay and they are um, they come about afterwards some of them come about after they are the way they are to done is no way that can happen when I'm shooting that can't happen uh, I have a way of working with uh, <laughs> let me, I'm trying to explain this. I should get Francis to explain it because she watched me do it. <laughs> you know, is that I have some, I have lights and I set myself in front of a black backdrop and I can, and I set the camera on a 15 second timed exposure. Mm. So every time I press the button to kick the shutter off, I got 15 seconds. So I do things with different lights, different things like that. And sometimes I use very little light, sometimes it's more light and the images become, yeah. let's put it this way. Sometimes I think I'm getting close to the spirit and other times I think maybe I'm just partying. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, that's a Ooh. great question. So the, the question is, when is the first time you held a camera and when did you know you could speak through a camera? No, it was real clear. It was in high school. And I was actually talking to someone who's you remember when the first echo went up? Some of you old enough to know. <laughs> when the first satellite went up, that little echo? Well, that night it went up. I was with the one who had a lint off camera and we opened it up and it, all it did was make a J shape on a negative. That was really the first time dealing it. And at, during that time, I was trying to take photographs of my sisters using only candles as ways of lighting it out and stuff. Mm. But then 
that went away. I went to college and did all the kinds of other stuff and it didn't come back. It didn't come back to later about, about the camera as a tool. I mean, I, I photographed, I did white paintings and I had to photograph, uh, you know, my paintings because I couldn't pay $75 a shot. So I got a, a used eight by 10 and start doing it myself. You know, eight, that's an eight by 10 format camera. And then I, um, so that went on with my life. I'm making, I'm doing drawings and, and prints. And uh, then I start doing concerts using my artwork as a scores for the music. Hmm. And halfway, and I've been very much interested in, you know, uh, John Cage and it's been time with Merce Cunningham, you know, at the studio. So I'm, I'm realizing thing about how to organize the pictorial space with gestures and stuff like that. And then what happened was that um, all of a sudden I discovered Gerald Wilson and Quincy Jones. I said, oh my God, that's city sounds. I'm not gonna draw that, I'm gonna photograph it. Mm -hmm. So then I went from an eight by 10 to a four by five. And then that went on and on and on till all of a sudden my grandmother got me and I'm photographing cotton. So that's, and I've never had a photographic class. Okay, so it's just, I just evolved through it. So, you know. Do you feel like the subject always drives you towards a medium? Cause you, um, because you, you've never had a photo class but you work in all of these other ways that you, you know, does printmaking uh, sometimes come up as, oh, I, ha I have an idea, I have a concept, it's gotta be print. Yeah, well, I mean, my assistant says like that, he said, John, you're just making lithographs using the camera. <laughs> you know, and so, I mean, I mean, we, we, we're just trying to, I keep saying, you know, I'm 81, I'm still trying to grow up. That's my goal. Question, yeah. What a gorgeous question about the utility, the utility of beauty. Of beauty. <laughs> I'm saying the utility of beauty. <laughs> I just trying to make a good picture. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> well, I'm trying to make a good picture. I want to achieve something visually, spiritually with the picture. That's what I'm really, I'm really striving to be, make a good picture, you know? And somebody says, oh, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you. But I, that wasn't the goal. <laughs> but for so many people, good is not about the aesthetic of beauty. It's not about, um, you know, what it does for the eyes. A, a photo can be good and and not be beautiful. There's right. so many great photographs that are that are striking that grip you that are that stay with you. I can right. I can you know when we have this conversation, I'm sure everybody in the room is thinking of a photograph that they've seen that they've their brains just won't let go of. And beauty isn't the reason right. that it lingers, but in your work, you have given us joy and beauty around a subject escaping a cotton field as a freedom seeking person that's not meant to be enslaved here anymore. That's not something that we think of that is aesthetically rich in beauty. So mm -hmm. what, how are, how are, how is that what you're doing when you're just trying to make a good photograph? Well, you just keep trying and praying. You do pray a lot. That's all I can mm. tell you. You do, you know, you. You listen, you listen, you really hear, you listen. I'm thinking about the times you really, I, I can tell you, you hear it. You really, really, really hear it. And it's, uh, 
It's like a clue. We all have our own means to who we are. And the more you start discovering yours, the more your own personal, the freer I think you'll become with it. And, and that's, I think, is the thing. This work? Yeah. Ah, the what's next question. Uh, no, I mean, I am working on some of, I'm going to continue working on my spirit things, but I have a, a project. I'm going to workshop at the Barnes and it's going to be a workshop at the Barnes. And then if it's, we get the right thing, then I'm going to go attack some museum people to do a gigantic one with the thing and eventually be in Rittenhouse Square going nuts with about 30 dancers and all the sound in the world that you're gonna hear that we did. So, and that's, that's where I'm going at the moment. <laughs> oh, turn this off. Thank you so much, John and Brittany. This has been a really fascinating conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, the exhibition runs through December 18th, so please come and come often because as John said, this is a slow exhibition, so you might want to come a couple times and really, I've come into the gallery multiple times, obviously, and um, each time I visit, I spend a little time and I notice something different. Um, so it's a very special exhibition and a very moving one. Um, what is the date of that Barnes? It's December 8th, right? December 8th is the Barnes um, program that John is referring to. So thank you, everyone. And um, for those of you at home, thank you as well. Good night.